uh, idea of who is using the accounting data. Okay, who's using accounting data? Notice we have a couple of different uh, users that we're going to be concerned about. On the next slide, we're going to talk about external users, but we also have internal users of the accounting data. These are people that are inside of the company. And so you could have marketing people, you could have finance people that are all interested in accounting data that we're going to be producing and learning how to put together in this class. So it's important inside the company. And when you get to uh, 101B, you'll really be talking more about the internal uses. In this class, we are talking about external users of information. So what happens here? Let's say you're looking at a company and you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe I'd like to buy the stock of this company. And you sit there and you say, how should I make that decision? And so you're going to want to look at some financial information. The financial statements that we will talk about will be useful to you in making those investment decisions. So if you were going to buy the stock, you'd want to look at the financial statements of the company, say General Electric, which is a public company. And based on what you see in that financial information, you could make the decision to go ahead and buy the stock in this company. Creditors, what happens? Creditors don't buy stock. They don't buy ownership in the company. They loan the company money with an expectation that there'll be a payback. But before they're going to loan that money, they're going to want to see some financial information to make those decisions. And when we prepare financial information, we prepare financial information for external users. That's really who we're thinking about. Okay. Now, you take a look and we need to think about ethics okay we need to think about ethics and when we report financial information since individuals are going to be making investment credit decisions we have to make sure that that information is reliable okay a lot of ethical scandals i'm sure you've heard about uh, enron you maybe heard about worldcom fraudulent financial reporting investors were harmed Congress got upset about that and they came out with something called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Sarbanes and Oxley are the name of the Congress people that worked together to come up with that act. Sarbanes was the senator. Oxley was the House member, Sarbanes a Democrat, Oxley a Republican, and they worked together to come out with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002, which was designed to help um, avoid some of these fraudulent things that went on with WorldCom Enron. One of the things they did is they put an onus on the board of directors that they will be responsible for making sure that the uh, financial information that comes out is reliable. They even instituted potential jail penalties for those who engage in, engage in fraudulent reporting. And a lot of people went to jail off of this. Some people actually died in jail as a result of some of the things that, I don't know, they didn't die because, you know, because of what they did, but they were sentence was so long, they ended up uh, dying in jail on some of these. So big deal. Now they did Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002. And I find it interesting that at that time, they kept saying, well, we're going to put these controls in place. So this will never happen again. Did it happen again? 2008, you had similar things going on. And you had the Dodd-Frank Act, which isn't mentioned on this slide. Dodd and Frank were two Democrat uh, senators that came up with uh, some additional requirements. So uh, let's see, 2002 to 2008 is six years. We're what, 2014 uh, would have been another six years. So we've got, we've made another six years without another financial crisis. So hopefully some of these legislation will start to, uh, will start to work, okay? Now, what this slide is getting into here is, you know, how do you resolve an ethical dilemma that you run into in your career? And you look at something like this, and it's very easy to say, well, that'll never happen to me because I'm not going to be dumb enough to get myself in an ethical dilemma. The reality is you may not choose an ethical dilemma. An ethical dilemma will likely choose you. Okay, and so it is not a matter of if, in my opinion, it is a matter of when. 
okay? And the best advice I can give you is if you find yourself in that ethical dilemma, you want to reach up to the next level in the company, your supervisor, whoever it is, and fully disclose at that point, hey, here's what's going on. This is my concern. Uh, how should we resolve it? Okay, that's the best thing you do. The more you try to take that and internalize that and deal with yourself, the worse it gets, okay? Um, now, uh, I had an ethical dilemma, and don't worry, it's not a personal indiscretion thing. I'm not going to sit here and uh, embarrass myself and talk about some time I made a bad choice. Um, I was doing work at the GAO, my office. We were auditing the U.S. Forest Service, and uh, I noticed some problems with their cost accounting system. They were essentially depleting the forest at a lower, they were reporting a lower rate for their depletion than they actually were. And so I looked at that and I said, hey, you've got some problems here. They said, you can't criticize us for that because GAO, my office, was in here just a few years ago and they didn't criticize it, us for it then, so how can you criticize us for this now? It was the same system. So I'm looking, I'm fairly new at that time, I'm thinking, geez, maybe I'm making a mistake here. I take it to my supervisor, he says, no, you're right, that doesn't sound like it should be working this way. Let me check into it, I'll get back to you. And I guess he went up the food chain and they came back and they said, John, the uh, Comptroller General wants to have a meeting and you're going to be in that meeting to describe what uh, your concerns are. Now, Comptroller General is the head of the GAO, okay, the big boss now is going to come and I'm going to talk to him about what my concerns are about this issue. And um, he gets a 15-year appointment, okay, the, uh, the head of the GAO, the Comptroller General gets a 15-year appointment. 15 years, that's a long, long appointment, guys. How long does the president get when they get elected? He or she gets, what, four years, and then they got to go through this ridiculous process again, and maybe they'll get another four years, and then they're capped, right? Maximum eight years. How about senators? Six for senators, for what? For House members, two years, okay? So the people that the Comptroller General works for have shorter terms than his term, his or her term, because currently it's all, there hasn't been a female controller general. Maybe one of you will become the first, right? Okay, so what happens? Um, you know, 15 year term, okay? Why so long? Consistency, okay, is uh, probably definitely helped by 15 years, but they can put other controls in place so we have continuity from one comptroller general to the other. But you're on the right track. Accountability, have you seen the GAO's slogan? It's AIR, accountability, integrity, and reliability. And sometimes some of the policies that I'd come up with, I'm like, yeah, it's a lot of hot air but as an employee. When you work for somewhere for 30 years, it kind of starts to become like a marriage, you know? You know where all the warts are and stuff. But uh, anyway, um, you say accountability, okay? How about independence? What happens? If I know that I'm in a position for 30 years, I'm not going to sit there. I mean, 15 years. They only give me 15 years. I almost, would I say a cent if I'm sentenced to 15 years? If I'm, if I'm appointed for 15 years, what happens? I'm going to have a much, more, much bigger comfort level with the decisions I make because I don't have to worry about, gee, in two years my job's going to be up and I want to please this person and please that one over here. And so what happens? A 15-year appointment puts that relationship. Uh, that independence there, right? Uh, my unobjective opinion is that the GAO is the most independent audit organization the world has ever known. I say unobjective because I worked there, like I said, for almost 30 years, right? So anyway, we go in, we brief the Comptroller General. His name was Gene Didero. Uh, Gene uh, was this guy that was like just really, really sharp people skills that I think helped him more than his technical skills sometimes, although he was very technically competent as well. So we were going to go into the meeting and, you know, he'd say, oh, hi, Mary, how's your dog? I heard your dog was sick. I'm thinking, I don't even know her name was Mary and he knows that her dog was sick. Okay, how's Beefy? Okay, so what happens? We sit there, we brief him. He says, no. He says, uh, we're right. 
we're right. We're going to stick with this. This is a good point. This is a good finding. We're going forward with this. And if the Forest Service thinks there's a problem, we'll simply tell them that was then and this is now. This is where we stand at this point in time, right? So that turned out okay by what? Bringing the thing to light and we end up making the right decision by getting others involved in making the, uh, the correct decision. Think about the alternative. I could have said, well, I don't know anything, I'm not sure, I better just forget about it and not uh, take this finding and not develop it any further. What happens? A little bit later, maybe a um, environmental group finds out about their poor process for depleting the forest. Would they be too happy about that? They'd say, hey, you've underreported that, and uh, hey, GAO, how come you didn't call this out when you were in there? And then we'd have a bigger problem, wouldn't we? Okay. So ethical dilemma, make sure you're taking that up to that next level and um, that will be your best bet, particularly as you're in the early stages of your career. Okay, okay. so that's the uh, primary thing that I'm going to say about ethical um, uh, information. I think you know that that's important throughout life, right? So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this next slide now. Uh, accounting careers, okay? Public accounting. Price Waterhouse, PwC, okay, they used to be called uh, Price Waterhouse, then they added Coopers, and I think now they just go by the PwC, and I'm pointing over here to uh, last year's event, but they are going to be back here on campus. They are one of the big public accounting firms. There are four of them, Price Waterhouse, PwC, Ernst & Young, KPMG, and Deloitte, okay, those are the four, big four accounting firms. They audit most of the big companies, okay, most of the big companies, Chevron, um, Apple, all get their audits through uh, one of those big four firms. There are also regional firms, uh, Moss Adams is a uh, regional firm, um, et cetera, okay, I'm going to sit here and name all the different firms, there's hundreds of them. Okay. Now, you can work in public accounting, and if you work in public accounting, what you would do is it would be your job to come in, look at the financial statements that are prepared by the company, and you will give an opinion on those financial statements. So the license that I have is a license where I can look at financial statements, and I can give an opinion that says, yes, these financial statements were prepared in accordance with the generally accepted accounting principles. Okay. And when you see that, you know that you can rely on those financial statements. That's what the CPA license allows you to do, okay? And so uh, that is public accounting. Now, you may say, well, John, I don't want to work in public accounting. I don't want to look at other people's financial statements. I want to be involved in uh, preparing those financial statements myself. So if that's the case, you could get into private accounting. Now you would be the accountant for Chevron. You would be the accountant for Apple and you would be helping to prepare that financial information that a CPA in public accounting would then come in and audit and give an opinion on those financial statements. Okay, You could work for the government like I did. I worked for the GAO all those years but there's other agencies up here. Security Exchange Commission, Internal Revenue Service, what do they do? collect the federal taxes, right, where they collect something like uh, two to three trillion dollars a year in taxes, okay, that's their whole job, and then you could have the FBI. All of these entities hire accountants. Now, you look at FBI and you think to yourself, really? What would an FBI do with an accountant? What would an FBI do with an accountant in their staff? Looking for money laundering. Money laundering white collar crime, those sort of things, follow the money trail, right? Okay, so you could get into, and really when they talk about forensic accounting, forensic accounting over here, that's the nature of how FBI uses accountants often, okay? So there is a, a need for accountants by the FBI, and if you combine that skill, you combine an accounting degree, CPA, et cetera, with language skills, Spanish, um, Vietnamese are some of the languages they stress. If you were to combine your accounting knowledge with those skills, you could have a very nice career uh, with the FBI. And what's nice about the FBI is you retire with a full pension at 50, at 50. However, you got to carry a gun and you could get shot in the process, okay, because there's, huh? 
Well, when I say a full pension, you'd be eligible for the full pension benefits. In the federal government, um, what you get is a combined uh, for a thrift savings plan, which is a defined contribution plan in which they set aside money for you, but whatever it pays back to you is uh, dependent on how the market performs. But there's also a portion of the federal pension in which they give you 1% for every year that you work there. So it's a double barrel. And so there is a portion of a pension. And so when I say full pension, you would have, you would have vested for that combination of benefits. So it's not like a pension like you get if you work for the city, then you're going to probably get 2% for every year that you work and you get a 60% pension and that goes for life. Or if you're like my brother and you're a teamster, then you get something like 85% of your pay for the rest of your life. Huh? 90 with San Francisco. 90 with San Francisco, the city and county? Okay, yeah. So uh, there's uh, some pretty good benefits out there if you were going to work in the government. I saw a statistic. Um, that it was something stupid like seven, I can't remember the exact number, but it was something like 7% of the people working for the federal government are under 30. 7%. And then some other statistic like 60% were over 50 or something stupid like that. So the opportunities to work for the government are um, going to be opening up and accounting um, majors are you know, probably going to lead that uh, charge to a large extent. So uh, not, a bad, not a bad way to get into uh, some, some nice opportunities. Okay. Okay. Uh, show me the money. Potential salaries in this area. Uh, you know, if you're in a public accounting firm, a large firm, you know, one of those big four firms that I was mentioning, as you move up, um, you know, you can make uh, more money. Um, what is this? Public accounting, junior, senior levels. I don't know why they stop there. Um, you know, large company, 384000 I have a friend who's a partner at Price Waterhouse. If you told him his salary was any of the numbers on this slide, he would weep openly. Okay, so, uh, you know, there's, uh, in, especially in the Bay Area, the salaries can be even higher than this. So this, this slide is kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's not that impressive, is it? Okay, you're going to probably be more around this top end of the 384, somewhere in that range, right? Okay. All right, you laugh. Why do you laugh? Or you were just laughing joy, right? Thinking about what you're going to do with all that money, right? Okay, okay, good. So you come over and uh, let's talk about the financial statements here that we're going to be uh, talking about in this class. And we're going to be spending most of our time with the balance sheet income statement, uh, statement of stockholders equity. We get into statement of cash flows a little later. I think it's chapter 12 that statement of cash flows and we only have 13. So it's like the second to last chapter. So we'll get to that later. But all of these are considered financial statements, including the notes. Sometimes we don't think of the financial statements as being the notes. Notes are probably as just as important as the numbers on the financial statements. So if we just gave you a bunch of numbers on financial statements and didn't elaborate on that at all, then you would sit there and you'd say, geez, I'm getting confused. As opposed to we can have a particular account that shows up on the financial statement, but then we'll say C note 23, and in there we'll be giving you a lot more information, written information about that. So the notes are considered considered an integral part of these financial statements, okay? When we prepare these financial statements, we think about the needs of users. We're thinking about what? Investors and creditors who are using those financial statements to make those decisions, right? Okay, and then what? Then when we prepare the statements, we have to follow generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP. What happens? We want every company to follow the same standards so we can compare company A to company B. We want to be able to compare Apple to Microsoft, don't we? Well, how would we know what the comparison was if uh, you know Apple was doing what it felt like and Microsoft was doing what it felt like? So what do we do? They all have to follow the same generally accepted accounting principles so you can compare company A to company B. You want to compare United Airlines to American Airlines? Now you can compare financial statements and you know that you have comparability there and uh, that will help you to make the uh, appropriate uh, investment decisions. Uh, 
Uh, you you do want consistency from year to year, so you shouldn't change your accounting principles like, you know, socks. But when I say socks, like in socks and shoes, okay? However, you can change your accounting principle from one year to the next. If you do, however, you need to put bright lines of disclosure around that. You need to report a cumulative effective change in accounting principle. You need to disclose that you've changed those principles. You have to get your auditors to sign off that the method that you changed to was a preferable method. So it's not like to say, you know, changing your socks at the end of the day, but it uh, is possible to change. But yes, we are looking for comparability from period to period as well. Period to period, company to company. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, good. Now you Okay, we have these different standard setting bodies here. And uh, you can see that we have the SEC here. The SEC was basically created out of the 1933-1934 Security Acts. And they were given the authority to set accounting principles in the United States. And what happened is they immediately turned to the accounting profession and said, you guys go ahead and set the standards. So even though the SEC was given the legal authority, Security Exchange Commission was given the legal authority to set accounting standards, they have delegated that to the private sector, this organization called the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Okay. Now, it is a seven-member board. Seven member board. Okay, it's a seven member board. Why do they have seven members? Why seven members? So when they vote, there's a tiebreaker, right? Because they literally sit there and vote on standards, and it is a simple majority to pass a new accounting standard, a four to three majority to set accounting standards. Now, um, I was on an assignment at the GAO in which Congress was a little bit concerned about standards that were being issued by the FASB and they asked us to go in and take a look and understand what their deliberative process was. And so we started out with the Security Exchange Commission because we have audit authority. We, when I used to, I guess it will always be we to me at some level. I'm retired from there now. But we have audit, audit authority over the Security Exchange Commission. And because we have, a, because Security Exchange Commission has the authority to set accounting standards, FASB opened the door for us and we actually met with this seven member board. Now, when you meet with them, you can't meet with all seven of them at the same time. Uh, you can't meet with four of them at the same time. If you meet with four of them at the same time, they could set policy in that meeting. That has to be a public meeting. We didn't want public meeting. We wanted private meeting with them. So you can meet with two, you can meet with three, but you can't meet with more than three. If you meet with more than three, it has to be a public meeting. But it's a seven-member board that does what? Gets its authority through the 33-34 Security Acts through the SEC. But they set those standards that all U.S. companies then have to follow when they set their accounting standards. Those are generally accepted accounting principles in the United States, right? Now, would you ever be interested in making an investment in a company that is not a U.S. company? Of course you would, right? Why not? I mean, if they have what? They have growth in their, uh, in their company, you're going to share in that growth, right? And so you might be interested in investing in a company that's listed on the uh, Shanghai Stock Exchange, right? Different stock exchanges. Now, what happens? they are not necessarily going to follow the U.S. standards. In fact, they won't follow the U.S. standards. So now if you were sitting there and you were trying to make a decision to invest in United Airlines versus Emirate Airlines, you ever been on Emirate? Anybody here ever been on Emirate? Okay, nice airline, right? Much nicer than United, isn't it? Okay, just by the ride on the plane. I don't need to see the financial statements. I'm going to invest in Emirate over United. But what? You sit there and you want to make the decision based on the financial statements, but you say, I can't because United Airlines is using U.S. standards and Emirate Air Airlines is using some other standards. So a few years back, 
back in the 70s, they created something called the International Accounting Standards Board, the IASB, and the IASB's job was to set International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. IFRS are the International Financial Reporting Standards, and those are put together by the IASB. So you have IFRS, they set international standards and they tell us here that hundreds of companies use I mean not companies countries hundreds of countries use IFRS the US still sticks with US GAAP don't they okay now a few years back there was discussion that the US would actually start using the international standards and this everybody used to say it's not a matter of if but when the US will start using IFRS what happens who has the authority to set accounting standards in the US FASB but it gets that authority through SEC doesn't it SEC is in what branch of the government in the executive branch of the government okay in the executive branch of the government does the executive branch of the government have all power no, there's a balance of power between the executive, the legislative, and the what? Judicial branch. And so what happens? If the SEC tried to come in and say, okay, everybody start using IFRS now, and what would happen? Companies that probably have quite a bit of lobbying power would go to Congress and say, stop them. If you let them change everything over to IFRS, the economy will collapse you know the aliens will have won at that point right whatever his reason they'll come up with the spaceships will have landed at that point whatever reason they would come up with and if you give the executive branch and the legislative branch something to argue about what will they do argue okay so what happens the SEC sees the writing on the wall they know that there's no way that they can just flip the switch and cause all companies to go over to IFRS by the way why would companies be resistant to that just going over and using a whole net of set of standards once somebody says the bell is rung and you have to do that yes sir it's very costly right we have all of these accounting systems that are set up to do things one way and then all of a sudden you go and you throw a cold bucket of water on that whole thing that's going to be very costly just to make that change over all of a sudden right and so they resisted that and now it uh, is to a situation where the US will probably never go over to IFRS so what we have is something called convergence okay we have something called convergence and with convergence now what we try to accomplish with convergence I think I still got my pen here okay with convergence that says convergence believe it or not with convergence what we try to accomplish is we try to get the FASB and the International Accounting Standards Board as much on the same page as we possibly can okay but it turns out that the ISB and the FASB are sort of like that couple that you know hey did you hear they broke up oh that's too bad I thought they were gonna make it hey did you hear they're back together they're getting along again now it just depends on what's going on at any point in time as to whether they're together or whether they're apart I'm of the opinion that there will always be differences between US GAAP and the international standards in this class we're primarily going to be focusing on what the standards that are followed in the United States okay um, I had heard or read somewhere that the uh, chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board was throwing his hands up and saying, I've had enough of trying to set uh, work with the FASB to uh, have our international standards be in much concert as we can with US GAAP. So at least we have the rest of the world, he says. Well, he really doesn't have the rest of the world because what happens is many countries don't take the entire set of IFRS. What they do is they cherry pick parts of IFRS that they like. Other parts that they don't like, they maintain in their own sovereign accounting standards. For example, if you look to what the statements are of the Ministry of Finance in China, they tell you that they have switched over to 
IFRS. But then if you dig into some of the details, and I had an opportunity to uh, visit China with my CPA review course because now you can take the US CPA exam overseas, and so there's broader interest in companies, uh, employees of companies taking the US CPA exam because foreign companies want to list on the US stock exchange and they can demonstrate that they have sufficient US knowledge of their staff if they take the US CPA exam. So we went over and talked to them about that along with in those conversations we talked about IFRS and they said, well, look, Ministry of Finance comes out with the statement that we use. The government comes out with the statement that we've used IFRS, but there are some parts of IFRS we haven't picked up. For example, in US GAAP, you were supposed to carry your assets at historical cost. What did it cost you when you purchased it? So if you purchased a piece of land here in the Bay Area, you know, probably near here, right? Nice Fremont Hills here. You bought a piece of land for $100,000, let's say, in 1974. How much is that same piece of land worth now? in the millions possibly depending on the size of the land but something about a hundred thousand back in 74 might very well be worth a million dollars now right on the financial statements on the financial statements of a u.s company under u.s gap when fasb promulgates those statements you have to carry that piece of land on your financial statements at one hundred thousand dollars they leave it at one hundred thousand dollars we have something in U.S. accounting that we call conservatism. Conservatism says that you should not take a gain until that earning process is complete. And if you're still holding that land, then you need to hold it at that $100,000, even though the price may actually be you could sell it for a million. You keep it at what? $100,000 for something like that, a piece of land. Now, we do that under the historical cost principle, we do that to avoid the situation of what? This consistency, the comparability be from company to company because what? We're sitting there and we don't want to be in a situation where this guy says, oh yeah, I think I could sell this land for two million. Well, I could sell it for three million and what? We lose that comparability from company to company. So we take that so seriously, we would not write up that land uh, even though it may be worth you know 10 times as much as what we paid for it. Under IFRS, they let you write the land up. You can write it up to a million dollars. You can just keep writing that up under the international standards. So uh, when we were in China, we talked to them. We got into, well, how about the historical cost principle? How do you handle that? China Gap says, leave it at its historical cost. China Gap does the same thing that U.S. Gap does, but there are other parts of IFRS that they cherry picked out. So the Ministry of Finance says we use IFRS. Um, so uh, I don't know that the IFRS has the rest of the world. The other thing about that statement when they say the rest of the world, um, what's the biggest economy in the world? You're sitting in it, guys. You are sitting in the biggest economy in the world. So when they say, well, at least we have the rest of the world, I'm kind of thinking, okay, well, you can maybe have the rest of the world. And you don't really have the rest of the world because they haven't completely uh, accepted it, right? I'm of the opinion that this economy will continue to thrive because of the what? Because of the ingenuity that we have in this country and the freedom that we have to develop different products and stuff. Should I stand under the flag while I'm talking about this? Okay, so I'm waving the red, right, and blue here a little bit. But what? Think about it. If you travel overseas, everybody's holding something like this in their hand. What is this? And it's not a sandwich. Huh? Maybe their passport to get in and out of the country. But what does everybody have? Everybody has a cell phone, right, which is made right here, isn't it? It was invented right here. It's made right here, okay? So I believe that ingenuity like that will continue to spur on the U.S. economy. Um, you hear about other countries coming up behind us, but uh, they're starting to have their own growing pains as well. So, okay? Yes, sir. Question. How the seven members, are they, are they appointed? Are they elected? How do um, they are... You know, that's a good question. I think they're appointed for a term, and, but I don't know if it is the SEC that's in charge of that process or if it is something called 
the Financial Accounting Foundation. I'll look that up. Okay, they have an, and get back to you on that. They have an organization called the FAF, and the FAF, the Financial uh, Accounting Foundation, is the entity that raises money for the FASB. Okay, for, to operate these FASB members probably make in the neighborhood of you know. If, if not more, maybe 500000 a year. So we have this FAF. Eh. We have this Financial Accounting Foundation. I'm not going to go back to the previous slide and try to write that because I'll lose all the genius thoughts that I just had on the previous slide. Because we won't. Um, I'm recording this uh, so that I can put it up on Canvas later so that if uh, people want to take a look at that and download that and look at that later. And I'm going to see if I can put it up on YouTube to be captioned so that you can kind of slow it down because I know I talk fast. So if you want to look at it again and see what the words are. Uh, I'm going to try to do that. We'll see if it's going to work. I've had some technical problems with it. But if I change it over now, I'll lose all that other stuff I said. So I need to stay on this slide. But the Financial Accounting Foundation raises the money for the FASB. But I don't know if they appoint the members of the FASB. So I'll have to check in and see if it's maybe the SEC does that. That's a good question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, we keep it at the original historical amount for the under the rule of conservatism to avoid tentativeness in terms of what the actual value is of that property. Because if we sat there and you know you think your property is worth a million dollars, this guy thinks his property is worth. Two million, and they may be similar pieces of property. There's a lot of subjectivity that comes into it. So to maintain that objectivity, we go ahead and we do not write the property up above its historical cost. Now, when we sell it, when we sell it, then what? Then we will show a gain for that. Okay, and that gain would be reported both for uh, book purposes and then with some rules for tax purposes, we we reported similar gain. Well, it could be a loss in the um, in the example that uh, I gave. That would be a gain, okay? But the loss scenario is a little bit different, okay? Because if the value of the property goes down, then under the rule of conservatism, we are to write it to that lower amount. So I don't know. You bought a piece of property for $100,000, and then later on, they find out that there's a toxic gas or something seeping up from the ground, whatever. I don't know. And so what happens? That property would go down in value, and you would bring it, and you'd write it down, and you'd have to take a loss for the difference between the original cost and what you wrote it down to. So under rule of conservatism, you take losses immediately. Gain, you have to wait until you actually sell that piece of property to be able so to take it. If you're trying to figure out what the value is because you want to take a loss on that property, Uh, yes, each company. You don't have to have it. You don't have to have it appraised. You would have to convince your auditors that um, that that was the value. And there's various uh, methods that you could go through to do that. For example, you can sit there and you can um, say that you're going to. Uh, look at the cash flows that are going to be generated from that property. Okay, in fact, the FASB rules are that you actually look at the undiscounted cash flows for the value of that property. Undiscounted cash flows that are going to come from that. You compare those undiscounted cash flows to the carrying value of the property, and if the undiscounted cash flows are more than the carrying value, you can stop because you're going to recover the cost. If the um, undiscounted cash flows are less than the value of the property. You have something called impairment. And when you have that impairment, then you need to go ahead and discount those same cash flows, compare the discounted cash flows to the carrying value of that asset. And that is the amount of loss that you have to take. So FASB has a very specific procedure that we use to write it down. Once you have written it down in that scenario, it stays down. 
you cannot write it back up unless you have held that asset for disposal. If you've held that asset for disposal, you're planning to get rid of it, you can write it back up, but not in excess of the pre-release of recognized losses that you took. So FASB got you covered, okay, in terms of what you need to do, and you would have to convince your auditors that you had done a good analysis along the lines of what I'm talking about. Okay, but that's like uh, intermediate accounting, okay? We won't get, if you're thinking, maybe that's why she walked out, if, you know. If you're <laughs> thinking that we're going to get to some stuff like that in here, um, it, it won't happen, okay? Don't worry. Now, notice on this slide, guys, and, um, you know, I didn't want to change back to that other slide, but because we, we were still talking about the Financial Accounting Foundation, but we have the uh, historical cost principle here, and we say historical cost principle. We record the asset at what? at its cost. We could also abbreviate that to the cost principle. Fair value says that what? That we should go ahead and write the asset down if there's a loss in the fair value. Okay. Now some assets like a stock, they will let you write a stock up. Okay. Notice I was using land in that whole thing because there's not a market in which we trade land on a daily basis and quote stock uh, st st quote prices on a daily basis. For some items like what stock, we all agree as to what the price is at the end of each day on those items, don't we? So for items like that, if there was an increase in fair value, they will let you write those up. So we're talking about that rule of conservatism, that cost principle for what things like fixed assets, land, etc., but investments you can write them, you, you are to write them up and down as the market fluctuates. Okay, okay, good. Come over and let's take a look at this idea of the monetary unit assumption. Monetary unit assumption says that we should not, we should not, monetary unit assumption says that we should, I mean, that we should, not should not, that we should report information in the financial statements using dollar amounts, using dollar amounts. So we don't sit there and say on our financial statements, what we have here is a very, very beautiful piece of land. That's not what we put in the financial statements. We say what? Land, $100,000, right? It is stated in monetary amounts. That's the monetary unit assumption. Economic entity assumption says that we should not commingle assets of different entities. So what happens? Um, head of a big corporation probably has a very nice house, right? Or an owner of a business he does very well in that business, probably has a very nice house, a very nice car, etc., right? Should we put those assets that belong to that executive on the financial statements for the company? No, we would what? We would separate those and he would report those in his own financial reporting and only those assets that are owned by the company actually get reported on the company's financial statements. That's called the economic entity principle. Okay. Now, you take a look at the types of companies that we can have, different forms of uh, different ways to uh, set up the companies. And we have proprietorship, partnership, and corporation. Okay, so let's just go ahead and take a look at the next slide and see what distinguishes these three different types of companies. Okay, and so we have proprietorships. Proprietorships are usually what owned by one individual. When that individual dies or sells the company, the company ends, right? Okay, what happens? We have partnerships. We have two, maybe three individuals that combine to form that partnership. If one of the partners dies of the three, that partnership is dissolved at that point. Okay, so it's all about what? It's all about management and what? And ownership being combined under these first two, right? Then what? When you have a corporation, you have separation of management and what? And the ownership of the company. This is something that's very important about a corporation. So it gives them a what? It gives them a limit to their liability. If a company does something bad, I don't know, a product harms a bunch of people, they don't go to the 
assuming there wasn't criminal behavior in the situation, they don't go to that CEO's house, CFO's house, and take their house, do they? The company may be liable for something, but what? There's that liability. There's that. Uh, that uh, limited liability there. There's separation between ownership and management. This starts to make this uh, idea of the financial statements much more important. Let's just use a simple example. Let's say that you own a company and you're going to leave the country for a year. And you look around and you say, John, would you be willing to manage my company for the next year? And I say, sure. You come back from your trip after a year or so, and you say, how's the business doing? And I say, oh, it's doing great. Everything's great. It's doing great. Do you believe me? Why not? Jeez, I, you, don't believe, you don't trust me that quickly? No, you sit in there and you say, you don't trust anybody when it comes to your business, right? So what would you say to me? Huh? I sounded too enthusiastic. Oh, okay. Oh, I guess we're doing okay. Okay. Whatever, but yeah, you didn't like the way I was trying to cover it up. So there's uh, there's that aspect. There's your instincts, right? Is what you're describing there. So what would you do? You'd say, hey, do you got something I can look at that'll show us how we've done, right? So I pull out a set of financial statements and say, here you go. Now what are you gonna do? Compared to the previous year, etc. Do you know what I put down in those financial statements? Do you know that's correct. Well, the company always prepares the financial statements. The company prepares the financial statements. The company has responsibility for the financial statements. The auditor's responsibility is to provide an opinion on your financial statements. But yes, you are correct. We would call in what? A CPA, someone that is licensed by the state, to look and say, yes, those financial reports look good before you would believe that, right? Okay. Well, this is basically what's going on with the uh, financial reporting in the stock markets. And then what? There's a separation between the ownership when you buy the stock and those individuals that are what? Managing the company. So what do we ask for? We ask for financial reports that will allow the owners, the stockholders, to determine how the company did over the last period or maybe potential stockholders. And even though we don't get into that in this class, we add credibility, we add reliability to those financial statements by having them audited, right? Okay. Okay, so that's where we're focusing on the separation between ownership and management as we go through and uh, talk about the financial reports that we're going to prepare. Okay, so let's look uh, at a couple questions. Um, these might be a little too easy. I don't know that I'd put anything this easy on the midterm, but uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some potential questions here. Uh, combining the activities of Kellogg's and General Mills would violate what? The cost principle? B, economic entity assumption, right? We don't commingle the assets, okay? When you work a question like this, guys, always read through all the choices. I don't care if you're willing to bet $1,000 that A is the right answer, because I'll look at questions sometimes and I'll think, oh yeah, it's gotta be A, and then I'll click on the answer, you know, and I get the wrong thing. And then I'm like, oh, why did I not just read the rest of them? I would have seen that it's clearly another one than A or whatever. So um, make sure you always read through all the choices, okay? Okay, good. How about economic entity assumption? How about this one? Business organizes a separate legal entity under state law. Having ownership divided into shares of stock is a corporation, right? Okay, good. I'm not going to give you a question that easy. Okay, all right. But uh, thought it was worthwhile to look at a couple of those. Okay, all right. So this is a financial statement. This is the income statement where the company reports and the bottom line here is the what? Is the net income that the company reports is $2,750 is our net income. Not bad for a year's work, right? Then what? We go ahead and we report that in something called our retained earnings. And then we take our retained earnings and we report that on something called a balance sheet in which we report assets, liabilities, and then we report our ownership, okay? 
Now, when we look at these financial, with the fantasy anyway, that uh, this thing is maybe working right. So we might have a little snafu in the middle of that thing. But uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look. And uh, let's say one day you're um, sitting somewhere and you're going and saying, geez, I don't have any money. I wish I had some money. I wish somebody would drop some money to me down from heaven or something like that. And all of a sudden, you hear a voice. And the voice gives you 20 lemons. The voice says, here's 20 lemons. These 20 lemons now will take you forward so that you can prosper in life, right? And you sit there and you go, okay, great. Thanks a lot. I got 20 lemons now. And the voice says to you, of the 20 lemons, they give you a tree with 20 lemons. Of the 20 lemons, 18 of the lemons are yours. Two of them still belong to the voice, right? So what happens? You have 18 lemons that are yours. Two of the lemons belong to the voice. So when we look, we have assets, lemons. They're worth a dollar each. So we have $20 worth of assets and lemons. And that is equaling our what? owner's equity of which we own 18 of the lemons and the voice owns what two of the lemons right okay so assets are equaling our liabilities plus our stockholders equity which was that equation that i put up before the whole slot computer blew up with everything right okay so assets equal uh and the liabilities are zero here so it equals liabilities of zero plus owner's equity now in the first year, year one, R -R -Y -R one is year one, we sell five lemons and we sell them at $3 each. So when we sell those lemons at $3 each, that's $15. We have revenue, something we call revenue of $15 because we sold $15, uh, $3 a piece, five, five lemons, right? Okay, that's $15. But we have to recognize that there was a cost of the lemons sold. We sold what? We sold five lemons. They had a value of a dollar each. So the cost of those items was five dollars, wasn't it? Right? So we have something that we call a gross profit of ten dollars so far, right? With me so far? But we look at the tree and we notice that the tree is starting to look a little peaked. Some of the leaves are falling off and we say, you know what? We're supposed to keep care of this tree so that it'll continue to grow lemons for us. We better go and buy some fertilizer. So you spend money on fertilizer and I say you pay $7 for that fertilizer. So after you subtract off that expense, you now have net income of what? Of $3, don't you? Okay, you've got net income of $3. Now, what happens? Assets must equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity, doesn't it? Isn't, it that, isn't that the case? Okay, and so what happens? When we look at the end of year one, we have what? We have $15 worth of lemons left, don't we? We start out with $20 worth. We sold how many? $5 worth, and so we now have uh, $15 worth of lemons. We have $8 of cash. Okay, now think about it. We sold the lemons for cash $15, didn't we? So we had a cash sale of $15. And then we spent $7 on the fertilizer. So we have what? We have $8 left of cash, don't we? Right? So we have $8 of cash, $15 of lemons. So our assets equal $23, don't they? Okay, and our owner's equity is what? The 18 that was yours, two that belong to the voice, and what? We have $3 of retained earnings. We earn $3, and we haven't spent that $3 yet. We're holding that in our retained earnings account. So assets, and that $3 belongs to us because we worked hard to earn it, didn't, didn't we? So assets are equaling owner's equity, isn't it? With me so far? Okay, now that's year one. Now, unfortunately, there's no way on earth I'm going to be able to get year two up on the next slide the way I envisioned I'd be able to do that. So I'm going to have to put year two on the board here. Okay, and uh, I'll talk through what I'm doing in year two so it hopefully gets recorded. But uh, let's just go ahead 
and let's take a look at year two. Let's do year two. So in year two now, get my little note over here, so let's just remember the numbers. In year two, I sell six lemons and I sell them at three dollars each. So if I have six lemons and I sell them at three dollars each, not a trick question, what's my revenue? Revenue is going to be 18 for year two, isn't it? I mean year two now, year two revenue? Okay, good. Now, I have to take the cost of those lemons. I sold six lemons. They were worth a dollar each to me when I sold them, weren't they? Okay, so I have my cost of goods sold, lemons sold, whatever. What is it? Three dollars, I mean, one dollar times what? Six lemons. So I've got what? In that second year, I've got a gross profit sitting here of what? Twelve dollars? Am I doing my math right? Twelve dollars? Okay, all right, then what happens? Then I go to the fertilizer guy and I say, hey, uh, I need to buy some fertilizer. And he says, I remember you. You bought fertilizer over here last year, didn't you? And he said, yeah. He says, hey, you want to open up an instant account with us? You can open up an instant account and you don't have to pay us for 30 days. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Huh? So I what? So that I keep buying from him. He's a pretty smart business guy, isn't he? So he sits there, a lady, whatever. So she sits there and says, yeah, you know, you don't have to pay me for 30 days. No problem. In fact, pay me next year. No problem, right? Okay. And so what happens? If that's the case, I still have that cost of fertilizer, don't I? Okay, I'll respell fertilizer. Fert, I'll just call it fert. Okay, so what happens? It's short for dirt, I guess. Okay, so I have fertilizer and I spend seven dollars on it again, but now he tells me I don't have to pay him right away, right? And so what happens? Now, when I report my net income, my net income is going to be five dollars, isn't it? The gross profit of 12 minus the fertilizer cost of uh, seven gave me a five dollar net income, didn't it? Okay. Okay, so now I have my year two, and this is my income statement. Now let's go ahead and let's do my balance sheet. Assets have to equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity, don't they? So my assets are what? Let's just go ahead and analyze cash for a minute. The ending balance in cash, ending balance in cash was how much? Last year was $8, and then I just had sales of how much? I had sales of $18, didn't I? And that was a cash sale of $18. Did I spend any of the cash? What cash did I spend? I didn't spend any cash on the fertilizer. The guy, you weren't listening to the story. The guy said that what? He said, you don't have to pay me now, pay me next year, right? So by the end of the year, I still hadn't paid him any cash, right? So I didn't spend any cash. So right now, my cash, had an ending balance of what? Last year of $8. I've added cash this year of 18. So I have what, $26 of cash? My cash is $26? Okay, good, that's $26. Do I have any more assets? Do I have any more assets? I still have some lemons left, good, I did what? I started the year out with, um, there was the, I started with 20, I sold what? Five, so there was 15 left. I just sold six more, so how many lemons do I have left now? I have nine lemons left. Nine lemons left at $36. Any other assets? I mean, at uh, $9. So nine dollars, nine lemons, a dollar each, plus the twenty-six dollars cash. So my total assets are how much? Total assets are thirty-five. And then what? I now have this uh, owner's equity over here, 
and my owner's equity. I'm going to go ahead and erase the cash. I don't need this cash calculation up here anymore. It's getting in my way. And so I have what? I have the total assets of 35, total assets of 35 going to equal my owner's equity plus my liabilities. My owner's equity is how much? Owner's equity started out the year at what? 23, didn't it? Started out the year at 23 and then I had net income of how much? I had net income of 5, didn't I? Okay, so if I look at my owner's equity, I still have the what? I still have your portion, which is the $18. I still have the voices portion, which is what? This $2. And the retained earnings went what? It started at 3, and I just got 5 more, so it's 8 now, isn't it? I retained three from the first year, five from the second year. So at the end of the second year, I've got eight in here now, don't I? So since this is now sitting here, retain earnings at eight, I add up my owner's equity and I've got what? 28 of owner's equity. Did I do my math right? Owner's equity is 28. You say, well, 35 does not equal 28. But now I have what? I have that liability of, how much was it, $7? I have that liability of $7 that what? That the guy said, hey, pay me next year, right? So I had a student one time ask me, what is a liability? I don't understand. And uh, when you ask a guy like me who's been in accounting for all these years, what is a liability? All I can do is sit there and go, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> and I thought about the word. And wait a minute, it has the word bill in there, doesn't it? Doesn't it have the word bill? So it's a bill. You got to pay your bills, right? If you got to pay your bills, all the cash that's in your pocket is not yours. Some of that cash belongs to whoever you owe that bill to, don't, don't you? Doesn't it? So I'm thinking, okay, bill, liabilities, that's a claim against my assets, isn't it? So of all these assets that I hold, the $26 cash to $9 of lemons, that guy has a claim of what? $7 of that is his, right? Right? And the amount that's left over, the 28 that's left over, is my stockholder's equity, which is an amount that belongs to the voice, to me, and the amount that I've retained of my earnings, right? Okay? Now, if you look at this whole thing, guys, this is a little messy, isn't it? This process that we went to, I mean, it even caused the computer to go haywire in the middle of the whole thing because of the way we were sitting there and doing this, right? What we're going to talk about in this class is a systematic system that will allow us to keep track of all this without this mess of running and saying, oh, let me erase this, let me put this over here. We will use a systematic system. I'm not going to earn any Pulitzer Prizes for that. A systematic system doesn't sound very good. But what? We're going to use a system that will allow us to sit here and keep track of all of this using this system that's been around since the 12th century. This system has been around since the 12th century. This accounting that we're talking about has been around since the 12th century. If something's been around since the 12th century, what does that mean? It works. It works, right? What happens? Look at telephones. Okay, yeah, you know, we have one where you have to hold it, one, and you hold this to your ear while you hold this other thing. Then what? A phone hooked to a wall? That's ridiculous. Why would we have that, right? So we keep changing things that don't work real well for us that we think could make work better. Meanwhile, this system that we're going to talk about fundamentally hasn't changed since the 12th century. That's how easy it is to use, how effective it is to use. It also has to be easy. If it was that complicated, they would have abandoned it for something simpler, wouldn't they? So really, this accounting process that we're going to talk about is very simple. All you're going to have to do is get used to some basic rules with it. You get used to those basic rules, and this is going to be a simple class for you. If you sit there and you resist committing yourself to that system, you're going to have a problem. If your music teacher tells you play Mary Had a Little Lamb and you're supposed to press certain notes on the piano 
If you don't practice playing Mary Had a Little Lamb, when you come to your next lesson, you don't press the right notes on the piano. And you don't play Mary Had a Little Lamb if you don't press the right notes, do you? Accounting's the same way. I don't care how easy it is. You've got to know what buttons to press to make this thing work, okay? And when I say buttons, I mean buttons in terms of the system that we're going to talk about, okay? The only thing that's changed in accounting all these years is we now use computers to help us with all of this process, okay? Okay, so with that, before we get out of here, let's just go ahead and... Let's take a look. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. You know, assets have future economic benefit, right? Liability, cash is an asset. Anything that has future economic benefit. Liabilities, liabilities, liabilities are a claim against those assets, like the seven dollars for the fertilizer guy, right? Okay, and then what? Stockholders' equity is basically the residual of the assets that are left over that belong to the ownership of the company, don't they? Just like we looked at in this little lemon thing. Okay, now you come over, and what happens? If we have an investment by a stockholder, that investment by the stockholder will do what? Increase the stockholders' equity. When the voice gave us the lemons, his share of the stockholders' equity went up, didn't he? And it was also he gave, he was nice enough to give us some of it too. Okay. Then what? Revenues increase the stockholders' equity. How did they increase their stockholders' equity? Well, our revenues were more than our costs, and so our net income went up, and our net income increased our stockholders' equity, didn't it? Right? Okay. You come over, they tell us that what? Expenses decrease our stockholders equity well that makes sense because what we took the revenues minus the expenses that gave us the net income and if there was what a situation where our revenues were more than our expenses our stockholders equity went up didn't it now they show us that dividends reduce our stockholders equity what is a dividend well at some point the voice is going to come back and it said, hey, I'm going to ask something for you, from you for this at some point in time. And the thing that the voice may ask us for is what? A dividend to pay him out a share of what? Of the revenues that, I mean, excuse me, of the income that we retained at that point in time, our earnings that we retain. And when we pay that out, that will reduce our retained earnings. And so it's going to reduce our stockholders' equity, right? Okay. So let's just go ahead take a look quickly at now those slides that we saw earlier and this makes more sense to us now revenues minus expenses give us what net income net income then flows down into our retained earnings and our retained earnings does what flows down into our balance sheet where it sits in the stockholders equity doesn't it okay okay good quickly this exercise this exercise and so rent expense is rent expense an expense yes it is okay don't worry your test won't be that easy okay rent expense is an expense what's its effect on equity it's going to do what it's going to decrease the equity isn't it okay how about revenue it's revenue what's it going to do to equity Increase the equity, right? Okay, because it increased our net income. Dividends did what? Decreased. Salaries and wages did what? It's an expense. It decreases, right? Okay. All right, good. And you can see our accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. We have the common stock. That was the original $20 that got invested. 18 for us, 2 for the voice. And then what? And then we had our retained earnings. Our retained earnings were made up of our revenues minus our expenses. We reported that off of the income statement into retained earnings on the balance sheet. And then we pay our dividends out of retained earnings. If I'm paying the voice some money, I am not retaining that anymore. I'm paying it out, right, in form of a dividend. So the retained earnings come out of our, uh, uh, the dividends, excuse me, come out of our retained earnings. Okay, now, I'm going to stop here, okay, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a look at this slide, and you can put this slide, get it off of uh, Canvas, and you can sit there and you can look at each one of these transactions, 
and see how it affects the different uh, accounts. And you can test yourself by putting this slide in slideshow mode and then what? Clicking forward after you've seen what the answer is, right? We're going to pick up right here and go through this exercise together. We'll go through the chapter, uh, the rest of these slides. We'll go through the chapter one quiz, and then we'll get through chapter two next time. So bring these slides, chapter one slides, these slides that are chapter one slides. Bring what? Bring the chapter two slides and the chapter one quiz and the chapter two quiz. You might as well bring that one too. Okay. All right, guys, have a good uh, evening. If there were some folks that needed to speak to me, uh, please do so. And uh, otherwise, I will see you next time. Okay, yeah, you don't, you don't have to have it. Let me...